Thank you, Father. So we are in, as Stephanie was sharing, this amazing time, this incredible holy time on the calendar where we're about to hear the sound of the trumpet. And we know that the hearing of the sound of the trumpet is, is not just a thing to do by road or in synagogue, but it's also a prophetic sign for what is coming because we know that there is an appointed time. Nobody knows exactly when it's going to be, only the Father, when there's going to be a trumpet sound. And the Lord returns and what Rosh Hashanah is, is the heralding of that time. It's the heralding of the, the end of days, essentially, when we have all of the spring holidays that have been fulfilled by Yeshua already. He was crucified on Passover. He was raised on first fruits. He was, um, the, the Holy Spirit was poured out on Shavuot, on the Feast of Weeks. And all of these were fulfilled. So all of those spring holidays were more than just foreshadows of, of things that Yeshua did, more than foreshadows of, of those amazing moments when Yeshua gave his life and when Yeshua was raised from the dead, more than just foreshadows. Those, they happened at those exact days, on those exact days. So now we enter into, after those, we enter into a long summer where there's no holidays. And that's symbolic of where we are now. It's just this long, drawn-out, Summer, we're like, when, when, Lord, when is this going to happen? When are you coming? When are you going to restore all things? When are you going to make things right? The world is so messed up. When are you going to come? Come, Lord Yeshua, come, Lord Yeshua. But we don't know when it's going to be. And then all of a sudden, at a time we least expected, the trumpet blast, the shofar sounds, and here we are. Game on. Game on. And I believe that Rosh Hashanah is a symbol of that, where there's a, a long summer, and then all of a sudden there's a shofar blast. All the other holidays let you know in advance that they're coming. And Passover, there's, there's, there's a season of cleaning the leaven out of your house, so we know it's coming. So there's this preparation. There's this preparation for the holiday. On the Feast of Weeks, on Shavuot, there's a preparation. You count up towards it. But on Rosh Hashanah, there's no preparation, at least biblically. It's become traditional to use the month that we're in now, Elul, to prepare our hearts. But in the Torah itself, it doesn't specifically say, okay, the day of trumpets is coming, so do this in advance. It just comes. Like a thief in the night. I believe that it is prophetic and it's symbolic of that. But we don't know the day, we don't know the hour, but we do know the season. We do know the season. Now Yeshua was asked by his disciples, like, what is, what's the sign of your coming? What's the sign of all these things happening? What should we be looking for? And the thing that's so beautifully nebulous about the Bible is that the things that he mentioned, most of the things he mentioned, can happen at any time, in any generation, and every person across time can be thinking, oh, this is it. This is it. I'm sure when the, the black, black Plague was ripping through Europe, oh, this is it. This is the, this is the moment. You know, in all these different events where I'm sure the people of God were like, this is it. But it wasn't it. So all the things that we see when the signs of his coming, when we see false messiahs or false Christs rise up, when we see wars and rumors of wars, you know, the wars that we see right now, it ain't the first war, that's for sure. There have been wars happening since the beginning of time. But so these things can happen in any generation. Natural disasters always happen. Persecution of his people can happen all the time. We certainly see that in the book of Acts. We certainly see persecution happening right there at the very beginning. It's not only a sign of the end, but it's all happened right there at the beginning. The falling away, even in the New Covenant, even in the New Testament, we see all these, these lies that came in and falsehoods that the apostles had to deal with. And we certainly see increased lawlessness. We certainly see it now. And we see it now in ways that not too long ago, people were like, no, no way, that's, it's going to be like that. Where we see good called evil and evil called good. But all of these things are beautifully nebulous enough where it could happen at any time. And every generation could be like, this is it, this is the one. And you know what? I got to tell you, I believe that the Bible is designed to be that way. Because when the, the, the apostles say, we don't know the day. We don't know the hour. Imagine if they said, we got at least 2,000 years to go. Imagine if they said that. 
what would be the attitude of everybody, not just the ones that they were writing to directly, but all the ones that received those writings and read it across time, what would Christians think of that? Oh, we have so much time. This is why people will say like, well, you know what, the apostles, it seemed like they were believing that the Lord was coming imminently. And I do believe that. It certainly seems that Peter and Paul thought that the Lord was coming imminently. It sure seems that way. But I got to tell you, it's designed to be that way so every generation can be ready. And can be in a posture of readiness. If, if it was written any other way, you know, we got a couple thousand years to go, that would incline people to lean more evil towards evil because there was so much time. But there's a couple of signs that Yeshua speaks about. That's not for every generation. It's for this generation. It's for this generation. He says, the good news of the kingdom shall be proclaimed in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the, and then the end will come. So it can't just be any time. The gospel, the, the, the good news of Yeshua, his salvation, it must go to the end of the world before he comes. And this is the hour, this is the time when we see that. This is the time. There might be a, 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 you know, a sliver of a tribe in South America that didn't receive it. But this is the hour where the gospel is around the entire world, more than ever before. I tell you, sons and daughters, that we are closer, closer, closer than ever. We're always closer than ever, but we are really close. Really close. Really close. This is the generation. And then there's a crazy little thing called, I love having the screen back there, Baruch Hashem. My neck is so much happier. And I'm sure, yes, thank you, Adonai, for your servants who give their time and their, and their talents to do these things. And I'm sure the folks that sit on that side of the room are very happy that they don't need to hurt their neck looking at those screens. They got their own over there. Bless the Lord. And we have a near tamid. For those who aren't familiar, that's called a near tamid. It's an eternal light. What it is in, in Jewish synagogues, it, it represents the menorah. It represents that, that temple menorah, the tabernacle menorah that was on all the time. It never was the eternal light. The eternal light, it was always lit. The high priest always had it lit. And the way that's represented in synagogues is called the near tamid. It's over the ark um, where, the, where the Torah is. So we have one now. So Baruch Hashem. So Yeshua gave one other sign. And it talks about the fig tree. Now this is more symbolic, but I'm going to tell you what I believe it is. And there are other theologians that believe that. Now I'll just read it. Now learn the parable from the fig tree. When its branches become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things, know that it is near at the door. The fig tree is a symbol of Israel. In multiple places, even when Yeshua, in the beginning, when he cursed that fig tree so it wouldn't blossom again, that's symbolic of Israel, the fruit that was no, there, there was no fruit coming forth from ancient Israel at that time. There was another parable where there was a fig tree, and with one, one year, two years, three years, there was no fruit. And then said, so give it another year, give it another year. So they gave it another year, but if there wasn't going to be any fruit, it was going to get cut down. That is a prophecy about Israel. But even though he said the fig tree will never blossom again, he gives a prophecy. When you see it blossom... When you see it blossom, know that the time is near. I believe that that was fulfilled with, the, with Israel becoming a, state, a nation again in 1948. So all these things, him returning, there must be an Israel. There must be an Israel. So we are in the season. We don't know the day. We don't know the hour. But we know the season. And this is the season. And even I need to be cautious. Because just like I said that the um, spring festivals were fulfilled by Yeshua... On those days, Passover wasn't just a foreshadow of his death. His death happened on Passover. So it's very easy for me to say, it's going to be on Yom, uh, Rosh Hashanah. The day of the Lord, the tribulation is going to be on Rosh Hashanah. His coming is going to be on Yom Kippur. But I got to be very careful not to do that because I don't want to put a timeline on what the Lord is doing and when he's going to come. I know the season. But I don't want to be caught on a day because I might be wrong. And I don't want to be like those who thought like the rapture was going to happen on, you know, April 23rd, 1985. And when it doesn't happen, there is all this disappointment. Right? And the Bible's very clear, very clear to the believers, to the believers. You don't know. You don't know the day of the hour. But be ready. 
But be ready. Be ready. It talks about be ready all the time. And this is what I want to talk about today. What does it really mean to be ready for the end? What does it mean to be ready for the day of the Lord? It talks about it in many, many places to be ready for the day of the Lord. You know, there could be a lot of fear mongering about it as well. Are you ready? You know, nobody knows what's coming. People don't know. I see it all the time. I see it on, on, on social media. And, and people, people don't know. People don't know how bad it's going to be. How bad it's going to be. People ain't ready. You're not ready. You're not ready. You're not ready. You're not ready. Are you ready? Are you ready for what's coming? Are you ready for what's coming? Are you ready for what's coming? And it's like, it's like a little bit of a feel. Like, oh, I don't know. Maybe I'm not ready. Are you ready? <laughs> Tell me how you're ready. Well, the scripture tells us how to be ready. It tells us how to be ready. And so today, I want to talk about that. So Yeshua said, you must be ready. But that's very unclear. How, do, how, how, are we, how are we ready for How do we ready ourselves? How do we be prepared? How do we have a posture of preparedness for what's coming? For the day of the Lord that's coming, for tribulation. How do we be prepared for something like that? But he says you must be ready for the Son of Man is coming in an hour you don't expect. So today, I want to talk about readiness training. Now, when I was at work at Citizens Bank all those years ago, we used to have to go through certain trainings to be, you know, kind of have so citizens at least can get certified that the employees were ready for certain disasters or certain events that can happen. It was a yearly thing. And what I did, it was online. It was all online. And I would go on to the little system, and all I would do is just click the next button until I got to the certification screen. I think a few people know what I'm talking about. Pray to God that there wasn't a test at the end because some of them have a test. And thank God for artificial intelligence that can give you some answers. And just go, click, yes, I'm certified. But readiness is something, that's a joke. But Yeshua wants us to be ready. And the Bible talks about being ready. So today, I want to talk about readiness training for the day of the Lord. And this is skimming the surface. Skimming the surface. This doesn't go as deep and as far as you certainly can for what it means. But I'm going to go through a couple of points of what it means to be ready. What, what God is expecting of us when it comes to our preparedness and our readiness for what is coming. And this is the time to do it because this is preparation month for the blowing of the trumpet, the sounding of the trumpet. And we're coming to a close of that. The trumpet sounds in just a few days. I've said this in the discipleship class. Like, if you knew the Lord was coming in a couple days, like, what would your posture be? What would your posture be? And that's an important question to answer. So, readiness training number one from the Bible. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. There are those that are afraid of what's coming. But Yeshua said people will lose heart from fear and anticipation of what's overtaking the earth. He said this will happen, but for you. And they will see the Son of Man coming in, the, in, the, in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to happen, what does he say for us? Stand straight. Lift up your heads. Because your salvation is near. Our posture in this hour in preparation cannot be and should not be and will not be one of fear. The posture is of expectation. When he says stand up straight, that means don't be bent over. Don't be bent over in fear. Look up, head up, back up. Posture. The posture of preparation. You've got to have good posture. The posture that we have before the Lord in this time of preparation, is to have good posture. Stand straight. Stand straight. Lift up your heads. It says in 365 times about in the scripture, it says don't fear. So don't fear what is coming. God does not destine us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Yeshua, the Messiah. Don't fear the end game is good. Keep your focus on the end game. The end game is good. Don't fear man. Yeshua said, don't 
fear that if, even if they can kill you, if you're the one that can send your soul to hell. That's who we fear. We fear God. Don't fear man. Our posture at this time, how, does, how do you be ready? How are we ready ourselves? How are we prepared for the end times? Don't be afraid. Fear not. Al tira in Hebrew. Fear not. You got that? Training number two. Avoid deadlines. Back to business. Business has a lot of deadlines. Avoid putting a time frame, as I was sharing, on the Lord. This is very, very important. As prophetic as you all are, avoid putting deadlines and timelines on the Lord. It might be imminent. It might be in the future. But you know what? When I look at his parables, so many of his parables speak about a master going away and coming back later than the servants expected. And what are the servants doing when his delay? So I have a hunch, even though it could be any time, I have a hunch it's going to be a little later than we think. I have a hunch that things are going to get bad. And even the people of God are going to be like, God, it's time, it's time, it's time. And he still hasn't come. But avoid putting time. This is what he's telling us to do. Don't put timelines on his concern. I'm sorry, on his, on his return. Not his concern, his return. 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 to 2 says, concerning the times and the seasons, brothers and sisters, you have no need for anything to be written to you. In other words, these Thessalonians were probably saying, when is this all going to happen? And Paul's answer is, I don't need to write about that. It, don't worry about it. Very similar to what Yeshua said. But you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord, day of the Lord, comes like a thief in the night. In other words, I don't need to, we don't need to put time to this. We don't need to put a, a time stamp on this thing or a deadline on this thing or to say this is when it's going to happen. We all know it's going to come like a thief. What does it mean to come like a thief? We all know what that means, right? It means it's going to come on a time unexpected. That's what it means come like, comes like a thief. It means that the thief is not, going to, is not going to come at an hour that the owner of the house expects. It's going to come like a thief. Un. In a, in a time that we don't think it's going to happen is when it's going to happen. That's what it means. It comes like a thief. But you, brethren, are not in darkness that the day would overtake you like a thief. In other words, always have the mindset that it's going to happen. Don't lose the sight that it's going to happen. That way, when the day of the Lord comes and things really go out of control, don't be surprised by it. It certainly seems that the apostles and Yeshua want us to not be taken Aback and by surprise by what's going to happen. He wants us to be aware that it's going to happen. Don't let it take you, even though it's going to come at a time unexpected, don't let it be like a thief for you because you know it's going to happen. You know it's going to happen. So don't put time frames to it. You, and that's, don't make it too early or don't make it too late. You know, there's the parable of the ten virgins. The ten virgins all believers. They were all waiting. All of them were waiting for the bridegroom. All of them. They all had their lamps lit. Every one of them. Five of them, however, didn't bring extra oil. Extra oil. Five of them who were wise didn't bring enough oil in case it was later than they thought. All ten of those virgins in that parable were waiting for the Lord. Five of them were very convinced it was going to happen imminently. Five of them were excited for, his, for the imminence, but just in case they brought some extra oil to keep that lamp lit in case it was delayed. And it turned out he was delayed. And the ones that thought it was imminent, that put the time frame to it, it was too early and they missed it. Don't miss it by putting a time frame to it. You know, there's been times even in Christianity when, you know, groups have been so convinced that the rapture was going to happen at a certain time and when it didn't, it led to things called the great disappointment. The great disappointment. An outcome, and an outcome of the great disappointment back in the 1800s was the establishment of other, you know, kind of cultish 
groups like the Seventh-day Adventists and things like that. But it, it led to a great disappointment because false time frames were put to it. So how do we prepare? Avoid putting any deadline to it. Any deadline to it. I mean, there are certain things that I believe, but it has to be from a seasonal perspective, not a, an actual perspective. It can't just be, it's going to come on Rosh Hashanah. You know what? Once I say that, he's not. Because it says everybody's, it's going to come as a surprise to everyone. It's a seasonal thing that we could, we could know. But don't put a time frame to it. That's readiness training number two. Readiness training number three is while you're here, use the spiritual gifts that God gave you. Use them for the betterment of the kingdom. Hang them screens on the wall. Use your gifts. Use your spiritual gifts while you are here. That's what the parable of the talents mean. I don't have the, par the full parable here, but it talks about the man that's a, to go on the journey. Who's the man going on the journey? It's Yeshua. He called the servants and handed over his possessions to him. Who's the servants? It's us. To one he gave five, to another two, and another one, each according, according to his own ability. And then he went away. And then he went away. And that's how it is with us. He gives us spiritual gifts. It says he gives us a measure, each a measure of faith in one place. And then when he came, he said, what'd you do with it? He said, what did you, what did you do with the talents that I gave you? And we know what happened. I don't have it on the screen, but we know the five was turned into ten and the two was turned into four. But then there was the one who misunderstood God, misunderstood the master. And she said, I don't want to get, be on his bad graces. So I'm not going to do anything with it. And that lazy servant was the, wicked, was the wicked one. It says in Romans that God has allotted to each a measure of faith. And since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each one is to exercise them accordingly. Exercise the talents that were given to you for the sake of the kingdom. This is preparedness training, readiness training. While he's away, what are we supposed to be doing? We're supposed to be using the gifts that we have. It says that for some it was given prophecy, for some that was given teaching. All the, use the gifts you have, and how did the five turn into ten and the two turn into four? Paul says, desire the greater gifts. Use the gifts you have, seek the Lord for expansion of your gifts. He's coming for an account. What did you do with what I gave you? What did you do? I gave you the spiritual gift. What did you do with it? What did you do with it? We maybe ask that question when he returns. In this parable, it seems that we might be. What did you do with the gift that I gave you? So use the gifts you have. That is readiness training. While he's away, how do we prepare? Use the gifts that he gave you. And readiness training number four is pursue holiness. In our lives. There's, again, there are so many parables where the master went away. And now we have to see how the servants were acting while he was away. While he was delayed. And then he came back. So there's the parable where it says that, Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom the master put in charge of his household to give him food? Give them food at the proper time. Blessed is that servant who, whose master finds him doing so when he comes. How do we prepare for his coming, we feed his sheep. We feed his sheep. That was the charge to Peter as well. Feed my sheep. Feed my lambs. Be out there and expand the kingdom. That is how we prepare for the coming of the Lord. Feed his sheep. Many are hungry. Many are starving. Feed his sheep. Who is the faithful servant who the master put in charge of his household to give, him food, to give them food at the proper time. Blessed is that servant who the, master, who the master finds him so doing when he comes. But if that wicked servant says in his heart, my master is taking a long time, and he begins to beat his fellow servants, and he eats and drinks with drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him, at an hour he does not know, and he will cut him in two and assign him his place with the hypocrites, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Don't let the delay... Diminish your zeal for righteous living. You know, there's uh, something that happened in the Torah, which actually is a prophecy for exactly this. Moses, Steffi spoke about Moses being on the mountain, and that first incline to the mountain took a little too long for the people. Does that sound familiar? The Redeemer goes up the mountain and is up there a long time, and the people are wondering where he is. Does that sound familiar? 
Does that sound like Yeshua? It should, because it's a prophecy of that. But the people, because he was delayed, because the Redeemer was delayed, the people went into sin. So be mindful not to do that, to maintain righteous living. That's how we prepare to maintain righteous living. Peter, in his letter, is explicit about it. He said, all these things, since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, this is talking about the end and the day of the Lord. He says, since it's going to happen, what kind of people should you be? Live your lives in holiness and godliness. That's preparation. You know what preparation isn't? Buying food. Getting CB radios. Digging a bunker in your house. Learning how to build a lean-to in the wilderness. Learning how to identify edible plants. Emergency preparedness is a good thing. We all do it in some capacity. Disaster preparedness is a good thing. That has nothing to do with preparedness for the coming of the Lord and the day of the Lord. Do it. Do it as the Lord leads you to do it. And emergency preparedness is very much a good thing. But it has nothing to do with, it, nothing to do with the preparedness that the Lord wants from us when it comes to his coming and the day of the Lord. And it's like I said, it's a good thing. And everybody has their different ways of doing it. There was this one rabbi, his name was Lyle, of blessed memory. I think he was in... Maryland. Susie and I ministered at his congregation once. He had so much dry food that you pour water on and it becomes like a, a filet mignon all over his house. Like it was all hidden. Like he would show me his lamp and he would like lift up the little uh, drape, you know, over there. And there was like a whole bunch of food, like this powdered food that you like, you put a little drop of water on and it turns into, you know, chicken cutlet parmesan or something like that. And it was all over his house. It was all hidden. You know, but that was, that was his, it was led by the Lord. Be led by the Lord with these things. But I tell you, when it comes to the day of the Lord and being prepared for that, it's got nothing to do with, like, survival training. Not that that's bad. Emergency preparation is a good thing. We could do it. But it's nothing to do with the sounding of the trumpet that's going to happen. Therefore, loved one, while you are looking for these things, see, they were looking for these things, make every effort to be found in shalom, spotless, blameless before him. And in Revelation it says, so remember what you have received and heard, keep it and repent. That's the season we're in, the season of repentance. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief. You will not know at what hour I will come to you. So feed his sheep, live a righteous life, be holy, and repent. That is preparation. That's preparation. That's how we prepare for the day of the Lord. And the last one I have is eagerly wait. The end of the story is the best end of the story. For our citizenship is in heaven, and from there we eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Yeshua, the Messiah. It says in Peter, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of the Lord. Looking for and hastening the coming of the day of the Lord. In that day, the heavens will be dissolved by fire. The elements will melt in intense heat. But in keeping with his promise, we look for new heavens and a new earth where righteousness dwells. So we are excited about what's coming. We're excited that we are close to the coming of the Lord. The Lord is coming soon. And when we hear the sound of the shofar, we are eagerly awaiting his return. We are eagerly awaiting his return back to earth, restoring all things, Israel being saved, the kingdom of God coming on earth. These things are at hand. So as things get difficult and as things get very, very hard and as times go darker, we have a hope. We have a great, great hope. A great, great hope that we are so close to the coming of the Mashiach and all things being restored. So we eagerly await him. So those are very, very brief training, a very brief training manual on what it really means to be ready. Don't be afraid. Don't put timelines on them and deadlines. Use your gifts while you're here. Pursue holiness and eagerly await his return. 
Thank you, Father, for bringing us to this time. We are a few days away from the sounding of the shofar, and our hearts are ready. Our hearts are prepared, Lord God. Our hearts are eagerly awaiting what you have in store for us. We are standing up. We are standing straight. We are standing firm, and we are looking up. The day of our salvation is near. We are eagerly awaiting, and we are eagerly exciting, excited, Lord God. We anticipate the sound of the shofar, Lord God. May your kingdom come in this world. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we are close to the great coming day of the Lord. In Yeshua's name, amen.